Uh, Anthony, why don't you uh, give us an introduction of what we're going to uh, talk about here today? Okay. What uh, we're all familiar with uh, what happened on December 7th, um, 1941, I, I'm believing. And so hold on, right? Let me get to boom. Okay, I was working on the presentation for a moment. Uh, all right, well, here at the Military Museum and Memorial, uh, it's uh, one of a number of days which we officially recognize. There are certain days of remembrance and uh, days of observance. And one of the, are, are we, uh, we're in go mode. Okay, so I, I have a presentation uh, that I will make to you. And what I have to do is put it on share screen. So I'm gonna put it on share screen. Uh, well, wait just one moment before I do that. Um, I've learned from experience that you have to uh, have your slides printed off before you, you go because you can't see them while you're um, making your talk. So let me just print out the screens, print all the screen slides. Uh, there's not that many of them. Uh, so let's see, full page slide. Nope, I want uh, nine horizontal and uh, I don't want to flip the print one side only. Okay, so now I'm going to hit print. Uh, you're, uh, you're, what you're looking at is uh, myself. Uh, where did I lose you? How do I get back to the? Oh, there you are. Uh, okay. You just need to share your screen. I, I will. Let me let me get the, the printout first. Okay, yeah. Darlene has a lovely background. Darlene, how are you? Okay, well, I'm here now. Uh, I got to hit share screen and I'm going to just launch right into it, okay? Okay, let's do it. All right. Can you see the uh, first PowerPoint? No, I still see you. Oh. Uh, how about now? Yeah, you're getting some action now. There it is. Uh, okay, fine. What you're seeing is uh, the building that houses the Miami Military Museum, and you're seeing it on September 15th, 1942, when the base was commissioned as a uh, Naval Air Station. So that's uh, it. They started work on it uh, immediately after uh, December 7th. Excuse me, can you share that as full screen? Um, there's a little. Um podium uh, uh, screen at the very bottom. If you press uh, on that, it'll, it'll take up the whole screen. We can see better. There you go. Click that. OK. Is that better? Not yet. I didn't notice the difference. Huh. How about now? There you go. Yep. Bingo. OK. Hallelujah. So, uh, so where was this located? Tell me that. The, the building is located, it's not a was, it's an is. It's a restoration, it's located on the grounds of uh, Zoo Miami. Okay, so- it was zoo, a limp base in the old day, of course. A, a long before there was a zoo, there was a forest on the edge of the Everglades. And it was, uh, there was a sawmill of the Richmond family. So when the Navy came in and, and uh, took control of the whole forest, 2,000 acres, they named the base in a Naval Air Station Richmond. Today, there are, uh, it's mostly uh, government installations of one kind or another. 
there's um, the zoo, of course, surprisingly, some, perhaps, is a government installation. It's parks and recreation. There is a large Coast Guard uh, facility still on site. There is a large Army Reserve Center still on site. There is a Federal Correctional Institute, uh, and there are uh, so several smaller activities, including the uh, brand new and illustrious Miami Military Museum and Memorial. We got, uh, the building was uh, built by the Navy, then it was used by the CIA, then it was used as an Army Reserve Center uh, during Vietnam, and then it was used as a Marine Corps Reserve Center. So over the uh, over the generations, you've had 50 years of pretty much continuous military use, whether it's by the, by the, uh, the gallant Cuban exiles fighting against Castro or, or uh, Marines going off to Desert Storm. After that, the building was put into receivership. The government declared it in excess of inventory, and that's a polite word for demolition by neglect. Uh, we saved it. It's been in restoration for 10 years, little by little, because it hasn't been easy. But uh, we got our certificate of occupancy the same week that uh, COVID-19 came to town. So um, we look forward to a grand opening, but that will be next year. So does that give you an idea of where it is located? Yes. Is it is it kind of to the uh, east or west of uh, Zoo Miami? Okay, it's uh, directly it's it's uh, directly in Zoo Miami parking lot. I can look out the window and see the fence, and on the other side of the fence is the Zoo parking lot. Ah. And if okay. you know, if you know, know where the railroad, the railroad museum is, I can take a stone and throw it and hit the railroad museum. Yeah. So we're we're there, but right now, thanks to uh, COVID nineteen, we are only open three days a week, ten to four, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Although that will change, God willing, if the pandemic doesn't change, then uh, I don't know. So we have to have hope. So really, you're you're still on the verge of your whole new beginning. There's been ten exactly. years of work yeah. in this, and uh, exactly now. And now why, that why doesn't should it be mean, easy now, right? It's been hard all this time. Why, why should it be we, easy now? Right, you're going to get a walkthrough. You're, we've had the the daughters of the American Revolution have got, we had both mayoral candidates came out here and they did Zoom sessions. Nice uh, uh, on military issues, veterans issues. Um, so we're, we're, we're out, plenty active. A anyhow, uh, how about I move ahead into uh, slide two, um, if, if I may. Please. Um, okay, that's how you do it. Okay, everybody knows what happened on uh, uh, December 7th, 1941 at Pearl Harbor. Uh, we had uh, the, the fleet, the Pacific fleet, which was based in uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, was attacked uh, on a Sunday morning at eight o'clock in the morning. And the, uh, uh, the, they caught the ships at the, uh, tied up at uh, the, the, the docks and they just, uh, they sank five battleships. We'll get back to that in a minute um, or two. Here is a dramatic uh, representation of what happened on December 7th, uh, a day that will live in infamy. Uh, by, su by surprise and deliberately, we were attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. 2,443 Americans were killed. That is uh, uh, Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and civilians, civilian men, women, and children. It was an indiscriminate attack. They, their, their mission was simply to destroy the fleet and they almost succeeded. 
Now that's an issue, uh, the attack we could go into uh, at, at great length and perhaps we will on another occasion. Uh, for today, it's important just that we know this was the battleship Arizona. They were uh, bombed and torpedoed just when they were, uh, uh, have, the band was starting to warm up on deck most sailors were still in their racks asleep. Uh, and at eight o'clock they were bombed and uh, ordnance hit the main magazine and the ship blew up and uh, rolled over and sank, entrapping uh, 1,102 of the crew members, uh, sailors and Marines. Among them were 10 Floridians. Now, if you notice, you've got some people saluting. Here we are on the, uh, um, the, the front sidewalk of the military museum. The fellow in the uh, kilt is a bagpiper and uh, he played Amazing Grace. We had uh, several people, uh, we had an invocation and a benediction um, as much as you can have given the circumstances that it's against the law to have groups of people, you know how, how it is, how the new reality is. But in any case, we honored uh, the 10 Floridians who are still on board uh, the Arizona. Uh, John Anderson Arendt, uh, machinist mate first class, and what we did is there were a number of uh, young people uh, in, in attendance and we had the ship's bell, uh, which is right there as you can see it. And we had the young people uh, ring, ring is not the right word. We had them toll the bell as each name was called of uh, the uh, Floridians who are still at their duty stations on board um, USS Arizona. And uh, John uh, Arendt, John Anderson Arendt, he was from Homestead, Florida. Uh, oop, wrong, there you go. Uh, Atticus Lee Blanton, uh, fire controlman, third class from Lady Lake, Florida. And there, there you can see the uh, uh, the, the, the girl ringing the bell, each of each one of these young people ha had a turn as, as the, as the name was called by, uh, Captain Amato, who was there. I, I don't know if you know, but it's, we're a kind of a military centric institution. That's me. I'm retired from the Navy. This is, uh, uh, the fellow at, in the blue coat, that's uh, our educational specialist, Tom Gammon. He's a retired uh, Air Force officer and also like me, uh, a certified teacher. He was, he was retired from the Air Force Reserve and uh, uh, the school board, the, the uh, public school system. Atticus Lee Blanton. Quincy, Florida. Uh, Relaford, Relaford Fields, uh, uh, machinist aviation technician, third class. From Pensacola, Florida, James Durant, aviation machinist mate, third class. And you can see the, the young person tolling the bells. It's a lesson. Uh, Chattahoochee, Florida, uh, Rex Hayward Mayo, uh, electrician's mate, second class. West Palm Beach, Florida, gave Claude Edward Rich, a seaman, first class. St. Petersburg, Florida, gave Dale Edward Rutten, electrician's mate, third class. This here is a uh, picture, uh, a depiction. You can see the Arizona if you look in this picture here. It's still there on the bottom of uh, Pearl Harbor. 
and you can see where the uh, the gun decks were. And there's still it's a uh, it, it's both a, uh, a cemetery, a national cemetery, and a, uh, uh, a landmark, a, a historic landmark. Uh, people can go take a small boat to the memorial. All the names are listed. And they include from Homestead, Florida, Earl Walter Smith, who was a fire controlman, third class. There is a picture uh, uh, Claremont, Florida, gave William Alfred Suggs. Uh, he was a seaman first class. And there is uh, a picture of Arizona uh, in its heyday. Havana, Florida, and that's interesting. There's more than one Havana. There's a Havana in Florida. That's another military story. That involves um, uh, Cuban soldiers who helped in, during the American Revolution mm. uh, under Bernardo Galvez. They fought in uh, the panhandle of Florida. And uh, the, this town is named after the Cuban soldiers. And the town of Galveston was named in honor of uh, Galvez, a uh, little known activity mm -hmm. during the revolution. Havana, Florida gave William Lafayette Watson, uh, fireman third class. And if you look, uh, one or perhaps even all of those young men are in that photograph, perhaps none of them, but it's entirely possible that some or even all of them uh, were in that photograph. So uh, moving right along, uh, we can't do better than that. We salute you. So if I may, what I'd like to do since we're rolling now, I'd like to stop sharing, bring the, bring the uh, site back to you guys of uh, the building and show a little bit of it to you. Uh, so I'm going to hit stop share. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you can see me again, right? Yeah. Okay, yippee yahoo. Uh, let's see. First, I have to get out of the chair. And remind me not to uh, drop the computer. <laughs> can, can we share that full screen? Yeah, yeah, if you tell me how to do it. Wait a minute. Is that full screen? No, not, well, unless we have to do it individually, I don't know. Oh, well, it says, it says it's in full screen. It says to exit full screen if you, Speak, of you, speak of you, if you put it on that, you will get uh, a full screen of you. For everybody, I mean, individually, speak of you. In the upper right-hand corner? Yeah. Uh, there's a speaker view. Right. Okay. There we go. Everybody has to Boom. do that. If you ha everybody has to do it. Up, upper right hand corner. I should uh, disconnect it from the power source first. <laughs> okay. Can you? Well, I can see. Uh, we, you don't need Christmas to. Tree. We can see you. You don't need to do it. Oh, okay. Tell me. Can you see the building? We yes. see the flag. Yes. Okay. Oh, we're going on a tour. Yes, you are. I, we need to mute ourselves again afterwards. Otherwise, we will keep popping up on the screen each time we talk. Okay. Okay. You're in the, the staff spaces, right? now and we're moving into the next room the yeah, dad did you notice the little man that turns on the lights i'm hoping you can see what's going on here This is Colonel Gammon's uh, 
quarters. You see, it's back. I think you might have gone through a wide. You notice um, we were in. What's that? Well, I suspect you, you, might have might have weak, you might have hit a weak area of Wi-Fi in the building. It just uh, it stuttered a bit there. Yeah, I maybe did. Then you probably there. You go. We keep uh, uh, bridge codes in there for important occasions. That's apropos of nothing. Hmm. Well, I can see me. Hi, how am I doing? Let me turn on the lights. So you actually have your laptop on a cart and you're, and you're traveling it around for us. Yes. Okay, we're on the second deck right now. Uh, the elevator, it's worth showing it to you because it was uh, quite an ordeal. When, uh, during the, the decades and it was a military installation, there was no elevator. And I don't, I don't think you mentioned that this is a wooden building, right? Yeah. Oh, and I showed you the picture in the beginning. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just to make sure everybody realizes it's a, it's a probably made of Dade County pine undoubtedly, right? Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. Okay. You're in World War II right now. The World War II gallery. Uh, that uh, stand of colors was um, donated. It's a funeral flag of a GI who was killed in action at the Remagen Bridge. And his family of locals, they donated it. You can still see the creases and what's important about it is, uh, aside from that, when we opened it all up to inspect, this fell out of it. Actually, this is a copy. The real one's under lock and key. It's a letter of condolence from Franklin D. Roosevelt. Uh, and of course, it's it, 48 stars, isn't it? Yes. OK, now here's, here's just a map of what was going on. And you can't see it because it's shiny, but if you could see it, it's the Gulf of Mexico, uh, the Bahama Islands, Florida, Cuba, all these passages. And there are dots all along the water, all over. Uh, the Nazis sank 98 ships in these waters. They sank 17 off the uh, mouth of the Mississippi River. They sank 35 off the coast of Florida. Uh, they, they called it the happy time. They were sinking ships. Okay, uh, I don't know how much time I've got, so I've kind of lost track of time. So um, this was a fellow who was killed in action. Uh, if you can see, yeah, you can see him. Uh, Isidore Stessel, he was in a blimp that was shot down uh, by a, a Nazi U-boat. Uh, many of these, the glare will uh, make it hard, but uh, for you to see what's inside. Although so Anthony, he, was, he was part of the team that was uh, running out of the blimp base and looking for subs off the coast right here? Yes. Yeah, that, that was the, uh, the K-74. They were shot down and he was killed in action. Well, actually, he was devoured by sharks. Oh my goodness. Uh, yeah, that's about the worst death you can have as a sailor to either roast or uh, have that happen to you. I know there was an issue too where one of the blimps actually attacked a sub. Oh yeah, oh, oh and they damaged it. Yeah. Uh, with, uh, with, with the, here, see, here's the thing. A blimp is this funny thing. It's cute. And they float over the football game. Yeah. Uh, rah, rah. However, comma, 
if you take the blimp, you give it, you give it a crew of 10, you arm them with small arms, you put a machine gun in the nose of the gondola, you put four depth bombs on it, radar, sonar, and a radio, and you, it's become a weaponized platform. And pretty good for hunting uh, U-boats because you can see them. And they can't see you so well because they were all painted with silver dope. So they would blend in with the sky. Okay, anyhow, I, I, I know you can't see all of this stuff, but uh, I'm just showing you some of the, the things. You may uh, see something there. Uh, can you see the machete? Uh, yeah, can, you can see that. Okay, that was, uh, you can't see the pictures there, but uh, during World War II, American military officers were sent to Cuba for training by the Cuban Air Force, as well as RAF people. So Cuba was an ally and they, they actually trained this guy and they gave him a uh, souvenir uh, machete, you know, that Cuban uh, iconic symbol. Uh, now up here, well, you're not gonna be able to see them, but uh, a Cuban Navy sub chaser sank a U-boat. So uh, uh, lots of activity in, in which they were uh, involved. Uh, Miami Beach was a huge training center. We have uh, the photographs from the, the fellow who was the, um, the phys ed instructor. He was a lieutenant, trained thousands of people. We have, what, what we're interested in here are the stories and uh, not the, uh, it's not a weapons museum. You're not gonna find 10 rifles in Iraq with each with the caliber of yada, yada, yada. It's, it's not an ordnance museum. We're about the people. Um, there was one, one and it's cabinetry with their stories, interesting. And uh, some of them, we show them as they were when they were kids and then as they were in, in old age, I'm just going to lift it off to see if you can, uh, can you see that guy in there? The, well, whether you can or you can't, that's him and his wife in old age. And uh, also him and his wife when, when he was in the service in Miami uh, and they were both kids. Um, and he was stationed at a place called uh, Naval Air Station Miami. People say, well, what, where did that go? It didn't go anywhere. They just changed the name to Opalaka Airport. Um, there's some atomic connections. The pilot of the Enola Gay, uh, his, Enola Gay was his mother. She lived in Shenandoah and he named his airplane after her. He, was, he grew up in Hialeah. Uh, the pilot, the co-pilot of the second aircraft uh, the, on the Nagasaki mission, he, he went to Miami High School, uh, Albury. So uh, let's see. The Biltmore Hotel, it was uh, an army hospital. Then we have artifacts from that. Moving right along, as I said, this institution is the Miami Military Museum. So uh, we, we have a lot of material about the second half. Let me turn on the lights in here. Okay. Uh, now we're in another gallery. We're in Cuba and the Cold War. Uh, the building was, as I mentioned, it was used by the CIA. Uh, 
extensively. And uh, freedom fighters, thousands of them uh, came here. It was the largest uh, station south of Langley, Virginia. And you have to remember, this is the last building, but at the time in 1960, uh, there were chow halls, officers uh, club, uh, barracks, um, shops, warehouses. So you had hundreds of the CIA agents and thousands of the exile community uh, who were part of this uh, anti-Castro activity, clandestine activity. Uh, the Bay of Pigs, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, I think my wheels are locked. I'm gonna have to spin around here a little bit. Okay. I'm hoping you can see. I think your laptop is aimed a little high. Maybe you can like tilt the screen down a little. That looks better. Oh, is that, that's better? Oh yeah, oh, even better. Okay, yeah, that's uh, the Brigade 2506. Uh, I've got some of them on the board. This uh, uniform there, this uniform was donated by a Marine Corps officer who at the time of the landing for the invasion of Cuba at the Bay of Pigs, he was there. Uh, we had an aircraft carrier, four destroyers and a, and a nuclear sub right offshore. And he watched the whole thing through binoculars and, and waited for the order to go in to help the uh, exiles. And they never got the order. Um, that was a politics, but in any case, and I'm just gonna spin around here uh, because a lot happened in, in that period of time, including the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I guess you can't see it because it's, uh, um, There's well, a little in any glare. case, a little bit of glare. Yeah, there's some, yeah. there's some glare, and I can't help that. But here's the situation. Um, we learned, as a result of uh, the Bay of Pigs, we had to live with Castro, and Castro hated our guts. So as soon as he could, he got nuclear missiles from Russia, and he aimed them at the United States. Now, uh, if a nuclear missile had been fired from Cuba, it would have hit Washington in 13 minutes. So that means there was no margin for playing around. This was uh, certainly an existential threat. Uh, the, these, some of these artifacts were donated by uh, a captain who commanded one of the batteries, this fellow right here. I, I don't know if you, you can't make him out. You'd have to be closer. Um, four nuclear missile batteries were brought here uh, overnight, along with thousands of other troops. There were troops uh, all over the country that were waiting on the tarmac to, to go over and settle Cuba, Castro once and for all. It didn't come to that fortunately, but we had 144 nuclear missiles aimed at Cuba. They, they were, uh, one battery was in Everglades National Park, another battery was in Key Largo, another battery was on Chrome Avenue, and another battery was in Miramar. And there was also about 500 surface to air missiles to shoot down their missiles. So it was a pretty uh, serious, way serious. And they even shot down, uh, it was one of our pilots who came from uh, Orlando and he overflew Cuba and they shot him down. And at the same time, we were dropping depth charges on a Russian submarine. So it was uh, pretty serious. Other activities during that time, I may have
Okay. Uh, well, you're not going to be able to see all these things. Um, there was also, there was fighting in uh, the Belgian Congo, uh, little known activity. The fighting in layoffs. There were agents from the building who were trained here and sent to fight in the CIA secret war. And okay, you can see it. That there is a crossbow. It's a crossbow that was taken off of Pathet Lao, uh, a Montagnard uh, tribesman up in the mountains of Laos by a, it was liberated by a central intelligence agency operative. And they, they went in with uh, fake names and, uh, well, in any case, uh, we got hold of the crossbow many years later. But uh, what we have here is the portrait of uh, Private First Class Bruce Wayne Carter. He was a, uh, a Medal of Honor recipient from Miami Springs. Um, Florida's only had 23 in its entire, and when we're fully blown, we will have portraits of the three locals. Uh, one was from Coral Gables. Uh, one was from um, Fort Lauderdale in uh, World War II. And uh, this hero, Bruce Wayne Carter, uh, was from Viet with, during Vietnam. The local VA hospital is named after him. And his mother donated certain artifacts. I hope you can see it. You can, but it doesn't come out. It's his Boy Scout cap. Uh, that young, that hero was a Boy Scout. Okay. Going to... Now, so far, Anthony, you've taken us through the second floor. You, I think you called it the second deck. And that's where most of the exhibits are. We might have lost some Wi-Fi here. I think we might have lost him. But that was very interesting. I never I never have seen uh, somebody give a, a museum tour by literally taking their laptop on a, on a little cart and wheeling it around. And that was kind of an, an interesting impromptu version of seeing. Well, obviously, we have it on our list for all of us when things are normal to go visit the Miami Military Museum. And I think that that was a nice little taste of, uh, of what it might be like to go there. And as he said, what's interesting is it's the stories of people. I mean, it's people from the area in the, all the different conflicts. And, uh, and you know, that really kind of brings it home literally to, uh, to hear and, 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 and see their stories. Uh, many of which are, are kind of unsung heroes, let's face it, right? So, uh, Maybe, maybe we'll get it back, but if, if anybody wants to uh, unmute and talk about, um, you know, what we've seen so far or uh, have a little discussion, you're, you're free to. I see Dolly's here with us. Hey, Rob. Um, I'm sorry I got in late, so I'm not sure what first half hour covered, but since tomorrow is uh, Pearl Harbor Day, yeah, 
Um, I have a memory of being in Hawaii uh, a week before the attack. Wow. Uh, my mother and I sailed on the SS Laureline five days before. And so we were safely uh, back in the US when the attack occurred. My father was stationed on a battleship and his ship that day was out at sea. And in fact, when they heard the news of the of their attack, they had sealed orders on board that they were to open in the event of such a uh, happening. And as it turned out, they were right where they should have been according to those sealed orders. And um, my father spent the next however many years the war was at sea on one ship or another from everywhere from Hawaii to the Aleutians. But I do re I have vague memories. I was only four years old. I have vague memories of, of Hawaii and of, of having planes fly over our house so low that they woke us up and shook, shook the house. They were our own planes, but they were rehearsing, shall we say. They expected something to happen, but they did not expect an air attack. And that's well, why I'm afraid. It was almost impossible, but then the Japanese pulled it off and that's why it was so unexpected, especially on a Sunday morning, right? Yeah, yeah, yep. Well, that's a great memory. Thanks for sharing that, Dolly. You're welcome. Uh, any any questions or comments? Anybody uh, uh, among us now has been out there and seen it? Uh, Marlene, have you seen it? Have you been to the military museum? I know he said recently they had the Daughters of the American uh, Revolution out there, and a few other. Oh groups. yeah, we we had the uh, we've had a Great number part. of groups. God, can you hear me now? Yeah, you're back. back. Good to okay, have you. yeah, I <laughs> I got far down the hall and and. Forgive me, but I, uh, the, the, the connection dropped and so I had to come back in the office. So that's food for thought. Anyhow, um, yeah, it's delightful that you're here. Uh, and you all should, you, you must needs be uh, considering uh, a tour of the facility. Because I think that, uh, that we've been waiting for the right time and certainly that's been put off a little bit, but, but I'll tell you what, that little bit of a, of a taste, a little teaser made it all the more interesting to see that your focus is really on people and stories. I think that's the, that's the part of that I found so interesting. Oh, yeah, that, that's, it's not about blood and thunder. It's not about Rambo. It, it, that's not, that's not what we're about. Uh, and basically you're not going to find, you won't find any more peaceniks than prior service military people. I and mean, none of us were, hey, who wants to go and blow up? Nobody, uh, not, at least not me. Um, I think Eisenhower kind of took that stance, didn't he? Well, of course he did. Yeah, I mean, it's not a... Uh, well, anyhow, we, we honor the service, we honor the sacrifice, and we honor the accomplishments uh, of the people from the service. We had, um, let's see, let me think of another group that was at the Coco Plum Women's Club. Nice. They came out, the uh, Society of uh, um, Civil Engineers, Military Civil Engineers, they came out. So, Dolly, all of y'all, you got to... You just got to come out and uh, uh, we invite you. Uh, there is something that, that in conclusion, because we are focused around Pearl Harbor, uh, if I may, there is something that I, I would like to, uh, I, uh, we've read the names. Uh, if I may, I'd like to read them again and play a little something. So let's, uh, John Aaron Anderson, machinist made first, Atticus Lee Blanton, fire controlman third, Relaford Fields, machinist technician third, 
James Durant, aviation machinist mate third. Rex Mayo, electrician's mate second. Claude Edward Rich, seaman first class. Dale Andrew Rutten, EM3. Earl Walter Smith, fire controlman third. William Alfred Suggs, seaman first. William Lafayette Watson. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our remembrance of Pearl Harbor for the natives of Dade and the Miami pioneers. Uh, thank you. And back to you, Robert. Wonderful program. I think if anybody has a, 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 you know, something they want to share about uh, Pearl Harbor or something, I know Robin and I had a real good friend in the Boy Scouts, Joe Crownover, who... Uh, Crownover! I've right. heard the name. Joe had a really interesting story in that uh, he was wounded to the point where they thought he was dead. And, uh, and, they, and he was just in a pile of bodies. I mean, there was, it was just chaos. And it took him a while to get to everybody. When they finally went through the pile of bodies, they realized he was alive. He couldn't move. He was paralyzed. Uh, but but uh, he was in hospital for a year. Came out with, with missing one eye. But uh, after that, really dedicated his life to, uh, to Boy Scouts, which I thought was wonderful. So you heard of them. We have, we have Boy Scouts that come out here regularly and, and sea cadets. They, they, uh, they yeah. would have participated yesterday uh, in our modest COVID ceremonies, but the law said, no, you can't. Um, I can imagine in the future that, that Pearl Harbor Day at the Miami Military Museum is going to be the place to be. I mean, everybody has, a, there's a lot of memorials, you know. Yeah, but, uh, but wouldn't it be just the perfect place to have a really large gathering in the future, huh? Uh, uh, we've had them in the past, uh, uh, BC before COVID. Yeah, yeah. And, and we'll have them in future. Um, I have a question. Um, have you collected uh, information about all the training that went on in Miami Beach? I guess in Miami as well, but uh, Miami Beach during World War II, I have a picture behind me of where they built it folks at the Ponciana Hotel. Uh -huh. um, and um, uh, they had people um, uh, marching uh, on golf courses. Um, sure. They had, um, um, I guess, training uh, for D-Day in the ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I would think that that would make a very interesting display of all the training that took place in Miami. You know, and you could add Opelaka to it because they were training uh, air crews and, and out there. I, oh, the, the whole, all of, all of Florida. Florida was a major training base. Uh, Fort Pierce, they, they trained the, uh, uh, the, not just the Rangers who stormed Pont de Ho, but uh, they trained the crews of the uh, landing craft. Um, and the underwater demolition crews. Were in yeah, uh, yeah, the frogmen, which became uh, the seals. Right? Yeah, um, the frogmen who later became known as the seals. Um, uh, Homestead that, was, was another train. Right, the the Homestead Air Force Base uh, was uh, well, I was Homestead Army Air uh, Corps. Exactly. Yep. And, and then uh, Air Force Base later on. Uh, both yep. of them had the uh, um, uh, tropical. Uh, training, uh, sea training for, for pilots. Oh, yeah. And, and, and they, they had also Alaska and have the northern <laughs> training. That the, the also that what, one of the things that people forget is that the China Burma India theater 
uh, was supplied from Florida. The yeah. three bases were Homestead, uh, Miami Army Airfield, and Morrison Army Airfield. Uh, and they would Miami fly Army Hill, Airfield. It was renamed Miami International Airport, and Morrison was renamed West Palm International. But they would fly the cargo planes uh, with cargo for China 18,000 miles. I mean, it was a long, and then you had to fly over the Himalayas mountains to get to China. And uh, on the way back, if they had room uh, and wounded, they would fly them back and put them up in uh, the Biltmore Hotel or the Don Caesar on the West Coast. There's a lots of lots of stories. I think that at some point, uh, 20% of all uh, World War II soldiers were trained in Florida. I, I think the number yeah, that's I, I, it's yeah, about 15%. Yeah. Uh, we of course, can that do led the, to a, quite a boom in uh, in people moving here after. Oh the yeah, war. They, afterwards people said it was the only fun place they had, you know, before going to the front. And there was no snow. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, you throw in the GI Bill and the and the special deals on getting mortgages, and and you know, South Florida just boomed with uh, with these little housing developments, right? Yeah, subdivisions. Subdivisions. Oh, oh and, and the first subdivision for African American GIs was a little place called Richmond Heights, mm. right a mile away from here. And it was first populated by uh, black GIs getting out of uh, the service and uh, moving into the a subdivision called Richmond Heights. And well, they took the name- really had, a, had a great effect on desegregation, didn't it? Yes, it did. You could say that uh, the, the, the genesis of the civil rights movement was in the barracks of World War II. Uh, there, there's, uh, when, the, when the Army Air Corps created its uh, officer candidate school at Miami Beach, um, they said that in every platoon of 50 people training, there had to be two African Americans uh, at least. So uh, being trained as officers, that, that's kind of prestigious. Yeah, and it, it, those are the some of the first activities. Yeah, I think when you've been in a foxhole, you know, metaphorically or literally, with somebody, you know, it's all the same, isn't it? Yeah, it's uh, nobody asked you what color your blood is. Um, I wanted to add about the um, you talked about the um, blimps. Um, Yes, sir. Um, and and the uh, all the activity of the Nazi, uh, 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 I guess, submarines shooting down uh, uh, the, the ships are all around Florida and the Gulf right. and, as well. My mother uh, 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 rented a place in um, the southern part of uh, Isla Morada, the uh, it's, uh, Upper Matacombe, but the, the near Bud and Mary's, if you know where that is. Okay. Um, and. Um, she would walk the beach all the way up before all the, uh, the dredging and, and messing up of the shoreline. She would watch the beach all the way up to um, Main Isla Mirada. And she would find all sorts of stuff. One time she found a, a crate of coffee, which was uh, in short supply that had uh, been you know, obviously bombed and uh, some ship would have been bombed and, uh, or, or torpedoed and it blew up and it floated in on the beach. She found all sorts of uh, life preservers uh, that she would take the kapok out and make pillows out of them. Uh, so it was a, a delight to see what would come in on the ships. Of course, they had to be leery because there, some of them could be explosives. Yeah, the Nazis even landed saboteurs yes. up around Ponte Verde. Uh, and, and there North used to be a lot of tar because some of these ships uh, would uh, have, uh, you know, when they, they, they were hit, the, the oil would uh, come in, uh, you know, float and, and congeal and come in and tar on the beach. Mm -hmm. 
We have a question from Ray Vaughn was asking, is there a radio room out there at the museum? Is there a radio room or was there? What, yeah, what's the question? we wanted to know, uh, uh, was there a radio room? Any plans to create a radio room? In other words, back in the day, there, there probably was some radio equipment in the building at one time or another, right? Oh, oh, absolutely. The, the base was, uh, uh, Google the website for, for more information, www.miamimilitarymuseum, one word, dot O-R-G. Um, the, the building we saved was the last building and it was also the headquarters building. So a radio in those days, they were huge. I mean, yeah. you know, it's with cathode ray tubes and all of that. Uh, and when the CIA took it over uh, a generation later, or a few decades later, uh, they just blew the dust off the equipment and, and tinkered with it and started broadcasting against Castro. So th there is a, a heritage of radio operations inside the building and uh, you could, there are, people that Mars is what they're called, Military A Aviation Radio Society, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, sure, uh, you could have functioning radio in the building. And that might have been the genesis of the uh, of the blimp that flies down off Kudjo Key, the, uh, is it Radio ah. Free Cuba? Uh-huh. Do we have a connection it's, there? Well, it, uh, Blips do have connectivity, whether you're looking for uh, drug smugglers or, or Nazi U-boats, they, they do have an oversight, a look down capability. Uh, they can see what's going on, you know, with the great circle of the earth, they can, if they're high enough, they can see what's coming before it gets anywhere near you. Um, we have, in fact, we still use uh, blimps these days in Afghanistan, but they're not called blimps. They're called aerostats because mm -hmm. they're unmanned, but they're up so high that the, uh, the enemy can't shoot them down with their rocket things. And they can broadcast, you know, they can send messages to our people. Uh, Interesting. This, this is Ray. Thank you for answering that. Uh, just, just a little bit more history in the area. Um, I used to, grew up in Perrine and used to explore around the blimp base from about <laughs> 1970 to 72 when it was quite abandoned and found all sorts of interesting relics as a kid. So lots of memories there. Um, the column right by your building, the large cement column, I don't know if uh -huh. many people know this, but that was one of the door frames for the blimp hangers. And to this day, it's got a lot of radio equipment in it. Yeah, well, here's what, it, yeah, you're absolutely right. And if I hadn't lost connectivity, I was gonna uh, focus out the window because that, that's a 13 story tall structure. And it has radio uh, gear inside it today because back in the day, after World War II, the hangars burned down all the wood, but not the pillars. Uh, there were four it, for each hangar, and there were three hangars. The county blew them up, but one of and 11 of them came down. We've got photographs of them crashing. One of them refused to go down. They, they tried three times. They ran out of dynamite, and they said, well, that's that, and they left it standing, uh, a weird monument to nothing, except a generation later when they created 9-11, uh, you know, call, call 911 if you have a problem. They look for the tallest site in South Dade as one of the relay towers, and lo and behold, it's that 13-story obelisk so now it has county people and it's crammed with, with gear and radio antennas. I uh, work for the fire department and run the radio system. So I'm in that building often working on oh, the radio excellent. equipment in well, there. Come on, come on across the parking <laughs> lot and say hi. I really hope to soon. 
Thank you. Yeah, it, I tell you what, Ray, just give me a call. Google the website, uh, Google me. Uh, you don't need to Google. 305-905-5196. Okay. There you, that'll ring. So call me up, say, hey, I'm on my lunch break. I, I want to see what up. Very good. And I'll bring you over to our place and show you what's left in the in that uh, column. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. The, the, the steam house is also there that created the steam that opened and closed the doors. <laughs> that that building is in rough shape, though. <laughs> oh, OK. That, now, here, let's get on something else of interest. Our building is on the National Register of Historic Places. We managed to get it on, OK? the building itself. It's, and when we got it listed, we got it listed with the listing of national significance. You can have a, a significance level of local, regional, statewide. The highest level is national. And because of its heritage, th they gave it that level. National significance is a precondition for landmark status or in historic district. You got the train museum right next door. Who knows what, uh, perhaps we could have a landmark out here. One of these would be days. Great. Well, give it time. Yep. You, Thank know, you. Ray, you talked about going out there when you were a kid. I, uh, Robin and I went to Palmetto High School and I graduated in 73, she in 74. We used to go out there and you could drive your car almost with your eyes closed for a mile. You would never hear yeah. anything. I mean, it was- Just, yeah. I, I remember this big wide open expanse of nothing but asphalt. And we would have to cross there and hopefully not get caught by the MPs on the way over to the fun stuff. <laughs> and, and, but the scale of it was off the chart, the, the right. size, right? And when you talk about that column and how much concrete and steel went into that, to those yeah. columns, I mean, they built that stuff to last a hundred years. Yeah. Yeah. And, they would, and they would have. They, they, they built it with the specifications being that the hangers would have been metal. Yeah. But they needed the, the iron and the steel for other purposes, you know, yeah. battleships and bullets. So they built them of wood. If you, if you look on the west side of that column, you can see a curved line, which was the roof line of the hangar. And you if you extrapolate where that curve goes you realize that the hangar was much taller than the column in the middle yeah. um it's it really shows you the size of the hangers in their day i don't know how they built them i mean it was just such the scale was just so crazy it was in the days before computers so you just built it extra tough you had lots of money yeah. lots of supplies so you you built something to last before yeah. the engineers the, before the computers and engineers came in and said you know you can save some costs here and there yeah they didn't they didn't build that way like the old florida homes my house was built before the hurricane code so i have uh two by 12s crossing my living room at 12 inch spacing it was years later that the engineers came back and said oh you can build a house for way less money and make it with just two by fours yeah, yeah, it was called Country Walk. <laughs> well, you know, also, if you remember, as I remember, they did jet engine testing out there with those. Well, that was Aerojet. That's another Aerojet. South Florida landmark. That's further south. I'd okay. love to get a tour of that going. There's a, a pit that still has the last one they tested down yeah. in the pit. And, and wasn't uh, there, there also some, some experiments with where they, they take the windows out there to certify them and they, they shoot a, a two by four out of a cannon? F I know FIU has a test lab for that. I don't know where they do it, but I, I do. Maybe this is related. Back in the 70s, I remember coming across some rooms near the old hangars that were just loaded with broken glass. I don't know what the glass came from, but there was just piles and piles of, of broken glass. I see well, those, those the hangars were uh, nearly destroyed during uh, in 19, the 1945 hurricane. Uh, and then the fire Homestead, after. Homestead uh, Army Air Base was destroyed, and so was... Uh, Richmond NAS. Yeah. And so the fire uh, that was caused by the, the hurricane. The glass would have been shattered. I don't know whether that's where it came from or not. Could have been. Well, Anthony, you really sparked uh, some wonderful memories here. And well, it's cool. nice that's to, uh, I, I love your, your trolley cart tour. I mean, that's, a, <laughs> that's I think that was yeah, wonderful. Yeah, you got, you got the nickel tour. 
You just got to get the angle on the laptop right, and then it works, right? You know, put, put a little small uh, pipe on the corner of that cart and put a webcam so that you're looking down at like eye level, you know, human eye level downwards, and you, you'll get less glare. Yeah, but it's yeah, a or we can yeah. or we can find a vaccine, get the COVID behind us, and you can come out for real. There yeah. you go. Wouldn't that be a hoot? But I'll tell you what, as far as other museums, you know, get a laptop and a cart during COVID and, and go on Zoom and show people your museum. I, I think it's just simple brilliance, you know? The Railroad Museum could do the same. Yeah, they really could. And especially when you're when you could reach out to people who couldn't physically or never had a chance to go. And now you give them a little teaser to see what's going on. I think that, uh, it, you know, I think that works brilliantly, so. It'll also get you some uh, national exposure and maybe yeah. some donations nationally instead of just locally too. Or in the case of something like this, this Zoom is being recorded. So somebody will, you know, be searching and, and find it in Google sometime, who knows what in the future. And and so have that little, you know, view of, of the cart tour and, and you know, sort of figure out what's going on there, so. I think that's wonderful. Uh, we've got a little more than an hour now. Does anybody have any more questions, uh, comments? Uh, feel free to speak up. I think that in that case then, we will say thank you to Anthony very much. You've always been a wonderful guest speaker for the Miami Pioneers. We always get a kick out of what you're doing. Um, you know, we have so much appreciation for your long journey and your and your uh, you know absolute dedication to the cause. Well, so. well, let me put in one one uh, one oar in the water in closing. We hope that COVID will be behind us by summer of 2021, and we have invited the governor to come out on the anniversary of D-Day, which is a Sunday, June 6th and cut the ribbon that for a grand fun. opening. So we, you know, we're, we're all COVID, but who knows, then or later, may, maybe later in summer, I don't know yet. Uh, that's that's, a, that's above my pay grade. It, it's also getting harder to plan things. You just have to, you know, you know that it'll come at the right time, right? Yep, yep. Well, well anyhow, before, I love before you. We go, everybody, let's take a screenshot. Everybody wave hello, you know, some sort of uh, happy message. And I'll count <laughs> down three, two, one. Three, two, one, click. Okay, I think, did I get it? Oh, wait, I get it there. Got to hit return. Okay. Okay, I have a <laughs> screenshot. Okay, I, I'm going to oh. say so long for now. Have and, a great and, day, everybody. And to everybody, remember always that, you know, you can always go on the website for Miami Pioneers and, and give us a little donation with, uh, with uh, 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 PayPal or your credit card or whatever. So I have to throw that in so that, you know, you, you're not unaware. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Anthony. We'll see everybody on January 10th. Marlon Everett is going to have a wonderful presentation on growing up at the Barnacle. So until then, have a wonderful holiday, everybody. Okay, thank you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.